Well, good morning. If you, and uh, we got some notes, so if you'd like some and don't have any, just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll make sure the ushers will get them to you. I'd like to have some notes. There's a few of you, just keep your hand up and they'll get them to you. Let's go ahead and turn your Bibles with me to uh, Psalm 73. Psalm 73. Um, at the end of the message, we're just going to just have a time of response to the Lord, asking the Lord to strengthen us as we commit to him our sacred trust. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons why it's called the sacred trust is because in Isaiah 62, verse 6, the Lord said that he's the one who's setting watchmen on the wall. And so this is a divine initiative. It's a divine setting that he's doing across the earth. And because it is his setting, that's what makes it sacred. And specifically as it pertains to our spiritual family, and the Lord has just made it so clear that this is part of our assignment and mandate, as, as Isaac just shared, which is the keeping of the sanctuary. And so if, you, you know, we believe that if you are here and if, the Lord, and if you believe the Lord has sent you here, then he sent you to be a part of that mandate. And, and that's the thing that makes this assignment sacred, the sacred trust. The other thing, too, is that um, this ministry has been doing this, as Isaac mentioned, since 1986. And, um, and what we would have is that we would have a 1,000 people in the spiritual family sign up every year to do one set a week, 1,000 people. And out of that 1,000, about 200 of them would do three sets a week. And so this is something that's been happening for, for almost 40 years. Uh, but Saturday and Sunday, those are the two days that uh, we need uh, a lot of help in. And so in a, a please pray and consider to, uh, to take your time and maybe use Friday, and, uh, sorry, Saturday or Sunday um, as a day just to be in the prayer room. You can pick any of the times. It could be in the morning, midnight, or afternoon, or whatever. But know that it's a, it's a real strength to our worship team. They get a real sense of strength and encouragement um, when people are there uh, seeking the Lord with them together. Psalm 73, I want to talk this morning about night and day worship and intercession that's sustained by the beauty of God. Night and day worship and intercession sustained by the beauty of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, your presence. And Father, we ask you, Lord, this morning, Lord, that you would increase, Lord, the spirit of inspiration, the spirit of revelation, Lord, on our hearts, on our minds, Lord, that you would open up our eyes, Father, to to see and perceive more, Lord, concerning the things that are on your heart. Lord, that you would uh, reveal uh, your longing and your desire, Father, and your beauty, Lord, in our hearts, Father, in an increased way. Father, even as we are before you, Lord, in this uh, another installment, Father, in your grace, Lord, to stand before you, Lord, would you strengthen us as your people, Lord, would you strengthen your intercessors, would you strengthen your singers and musicians, Father, who cry out before you? Lord, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we ask you, God, that in these next few moments, Lord, that you would magnify your son in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when we're talking about the issue of being sustained by the beauty of God, really what I'm referring to specifically, and there's many, many things to be said about the beauty of God, and and in a lot in simple ways, the God's beauty is defined as the understanding of His character, the understanding of His power, and the understanding of His purpose. That these three things together, His character or His personality, His power and purpose, um, help is what brings us into understanding the beauty of who He is. And the beauty of God is that which sustains us in the rigor of the day-to-day. -day. And in the particular, what we're talking about uh, this, uh, this morning, is just in the rigor of the assignment of keeping the sacred charge. Just the rigor, just the day in and the day out, different, different expressions, different amounts, one set a week, three sets a week, six sets a week, whatever it is. There's a rigor in that. And the beauty of the Lord, the understanding of that is part of what uh, sustains us in the midst of the rigor. Secondly, the beauty of God is what sustains us in the delay. There are things that the Lord has promised prophetically, and even more importantly, there's things that the Lord promised in the scripture of the things that he would do 
um, asked uh, in the generation of his return in terms of the release of his power, uh, the strengthening of the church, the healing of the church, the unifying of the church, the wholeness within the church, the establishing of the first commandment in the first place, uh, the reaping of the great harvest, uh, the release of his divine activity as he shakes the nations. There are a tremendous amount of things that the Lord has promised, but, but there's a delay. Just like every promise, whether a personal promise from the Lord to us or a corporate promise, there is a delay. But it's the beauty of the Lord that is the understanding of his majesty, his splendor, the, the, uh, 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 the attractiveness of, his, of him, if I can say it that way, is what sustains us even in the place of the delay I find it so interesting that when the Lord spoke to Bob Jones back in 1983, that it was Psalm 27:4 that he spoke as the as the cornerstone passage, so to speak, uh, uh, in a, related to night and day prayer. And I think that with that was the invitation for, of us as a people to engage with the beauty of God. And number two, with that I think came the assurance from the Lord that He would give us grace to engage with Him in that way. Now, Psalm 73 is a, it's a, it's a tremendous psalm. We're not going to go through all the psalms. I just want to point out verse 15. But to kind of give a little bit of a context of verse 15, Psalm 73 is a psalm about not quitting in the context of our generational assignment. Psalm 73 is about not quitting in the midst of the delay because what is happening in Psalm 73 is a psalmist, he's tempted to quit in the midst of the delay, number one. And number two, in the, in the midst of the delay, the God's strategic delay related to his promises, began to wonder whether the cost was actually worth it. And was wrestling with that, and in the wrestle discovered that it was in fact worth it. And the psalm ends with a very, very powerful truth, and that is that God is our portion. That the Lord is our reward. Yes, there's a promise, but the promise is not the reward. God is the reward. God is the prize, the beauty of him, and that's what we're talking about this morning. And so in verse 17, he says, if I had said, or, and I will speak thus, and, and what he's saying is the first 14 verses is the wrestle that he was going through. And the wrestle was really, really, really intense. And he said, if I'd continued in this mindset and if I had yielded to this mindset, he says that I would have been untrue to the generation. In other words, I would have been untrue to, to the promise and the purpose and the assignment and the blessing and the inheritance that the Lord has for this generation of which, I have been a, uh, of which I've been called to be a part of and labor as, as a leader. It's a, 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 Asaph is the, the writer that he's saying in, in Psalm 73. The entire body of Christ in the earth is responsible for the generational assignment. I believe that every generation of believers has a unique assignment that has a unique set of challenges that requires a corresponding response to that assignment and challenge through the lens of the gospel. Paragraph C, again, each generation has a specific assignment from the Lord that are called to fulfill. For instance, the early church, I believe, had a very specific assignment, and that assignment was to, to give birth to the church, uh, to give birth to the church and to see the church through, so to speak, through her infancy. Number one, number two, uh, some of the apostles, they were tasked with, uh, with the writing of the scripture, the, 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 complete, the, the completion of the writing of the scripture. That was a generational assignment. There's no other generation that has that assignment except for that generation was to, to complete uh, the canon of Scripture, so to speak. Thirdly, um, there was an assignment to prophesy and to speak of things of which the full implications of them would not manifest until the end of the age. And so the apostles, they were speaking of things very similar to the Old Testament prophets, 1 Peter 1, verse 11 and 12, where they were actually speaking, thus ministering to the generation of which the Lord was going to return. That was part of their stewardship, was to hold the line, to speak of things that manifested in some token way in their generation, but they would manifest in fullness in a generation of the Lord's return. Another aspect of, of a generational assignment would be to contend and to believe for the full 
a restoration of the nation of Israel, for Israel to enter into the full promises that the Lord made to her according to the, prom, uh, according to the prophets. Another example of a generational example, example uh, assignment of the final generation is the completion of the preaching of the gospel. Matthew 24, verse 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the nations, and then the end will come. Of course, every generation was tasked with the preaching of the gospel, but the final generation is tasked with the completion of the gospel. And, there, and there's a whole series of challenges as well as opportunities that come with that assignment. And so Psalm 73 tells us that there is this thing called being true to the generation in which you live. And I believe that we're living in the beginnings of this final generation that has a unique set of opportunities and challenges that go along with the assignment of the Lord. Paragraph D, our spiritual family has a privilege of having an invitation and a mandate uh, to partner with the Lord in a very specific way. And so whereas there is a generational assignment that the entire body of Christ in the earth has to embrace, I believe that different streams and different groups and different organizations and all tribes and whatever, they have specific assignments that the Lord has entrusted to them that if they enter into that assignment and as they embrace that assignment, it ends up being a blessing to the entire body of Christ as a generation is seeking to complete the task of the Lord. I want to say something as, as, as I'm thinking about something here this morning is that for some of you, this might be a little bit of a new idea, and this thing of a generational assignment. And here's why. It's because in the church culture in America and in the Western world, uh, the church has been a place where we get our therapeutic needs met. And Yes, there is this place of the therapeutic needs in, in terms of our emotional needs. We get taken care of. We have a sense of belonging. But beloved, our God is a father, but he's not only a father, he's a king, and he's a judge. And, and, and there's, there, there's an assignment. There's a kingdom that we are a part of, and there's a kingdom that the father wants his children to participate in with. And so each generation has an assignment that he wants us to link arms with through the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, with one another, and accomplishing that task together. And so again, as a spiritual family, we have a unique assignment that's been given to us. We exist as a community to, to partner in the Great Commission. In other words, what we do is not so unique that it's not found in the New Testament. No, we are a New Testament community that exists to partner in the Great Commission. We do community, New Testament community, and we do the New Testament uh, mandate in terms, of, uh, in terms of partnering in the Great Commission. But we do it in a specific way. We do it by the advancing of night and day prayer and uh, with worship and the proclamation of the beauty of Jesus and his glorious return. And this morning, we're talking about specifically about keeping the sanctuary. The, the, uh, the advancing of nine-day prayer. And again, as Isaac mentioned earlier, there are various um, levels of commitment in which people participate. There's those that are about 500 that are on staff full-time, and, and they, they do that as a full-time occupation. There's those that do it part-time. And then we've got an intercession ministry team, and then we've got our, our FC family, and we get different degrees in which people, we all can participate. But this assignment, I believe, has been given to us as a family together and we get invited to participate that at very, in, in various ways. And so the Holy Spirit is raising up in the earth a, um, a global worship and prayer movement of which a part of our assignment is to help give leadership to that prayer movement. Uh, again, there are other groups that are doing it as well, but we have a significant role to play in helping to give leadership to that movement. And the thing that has been so striking to me, and I, I think Isaac and different ones, uh, Dave Slyker mentioned it the other day as well, is that we just had a week of the send and the flood. And I mean, just, I mean, just so many people, I mean, just over and over and over again, not from Kansas City, but from different groups that were just thanking uh, our spiritual family, really, just for the years of just keeping the sanctuary. I mean, of all the things they would thank us for, it was over and over again about 
uh, keeping the sanctuary, as they were connecting the dots, what was happening in their ministry, and just all kinds of different places, how it was connected to a people uh, giving themselves to night and day prayer. And so the Spirit is, he is raising up a movement of, of night and day prayer all across the nations to, to contend for an historic outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Job chapter 2, verse 28, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And, a, and, and there's a prophetic dimension that comes with that. And there's, a, there's an evangelistic dimension that comes with that. There's dreams and visions. And all those who call unto the name of the Lord will be saved. There's a task to, to complete the, uh, the gospel as a witness to all the nations. The, the partnering with the Holy Spirit in, insofar as his unique activities uh, as it relates to the establishing of the first commandment in the first place, the ingathering of the global harvest and the administration of, of God's, um, God's global shakings. Now, there's a, there's a strategic delay in God's administration, as I mentioned earlier, both um, in corporate as well as our private lives. Now, one of the reasons why, I mean, there's many reasons, but I just want to highlight just two basic reasons why I think there is a strategic delay. Reason number one is because the Lord is after something. He's after something actually greater than the release of the promise, and that is for the nature and the character of his son Jesus to be formed in us. Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, Paul tells the church of Galatia, he says, look, he says, I'm in, he says, I'm in labor again. I'm in deep intercession again for you until Christ is formed in you. And so during the, the delay, the, the, all the dynamics of the delay create opportunities for us to yield to the Lord in some deeper ways for Christ to be formed. And then secondly, it is, uh, the delay is designed to to prepare us as a people to receive the inheritance so that the positive and the negative pressures doesn't cause us to crumble underneath it. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 23 makes it very clear that an inheritance that is gained before its time will end up not being a blessing to you. And so, you know, so sometimes I actually think about the things that we're asking for and I go, huh, it would be really good, but you know what? Mm. Like, if you actually think about the implications, I mean, we get unfriended on Facebook and we have a crisis. <laughs> okay, I'm moving right along. Let's keep it. Let's, I was doing so good. Let's just keep moving. Okay. All right, let's see here. <laughs> Divine delays can produce very powerful dynamics of pain and disillusionment in our hearts. And what happens when the disillusionment comes, it settles in, the temptation is to cling all the more to the promises as primary and as a result begin to lose sight of the bigger picture, which is that there is a greater reward, which is God himself. God himself. The Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 4 and 9, he talks about these scoffers. Now, in context of this passage, he's talking specifically about the promise of his coming. But I think that this verse has application for us in the, quote, unquote, the, uh, the, the small p promises. That in the delay, there is a scoffing spirit that can begin to grab a hold of our hearts, number one. And number two, the result of it is as we begin to walk according to our own lust. Now, when, I don't want you to check out when you hear the word lust, because when we think the word lust, immediately we go to sexual lust, and that is definitely part of it. But instead of only thinking about sexual lust, there's more that, is, that, is, that he's saying there. He's talking about where the, the, the scoffers, because of the delay, they conclude that it's okay to walk in their own way. In their own way in, in everything. Thought life, body life, money life, relationships, speech-wise, I mean, just the whole, well, we begin to embrace our own way. And this happens because of the delay. Now, misery loves company. Some of you know me well enough to know that when I say that phrase, it's, 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 it's fixing to come. Okay, here we go. There are four aspects of what it means to be a scoffer. When we think of scoffing, we immediately think about the person railing on, 
on TV or on social media or whatever. But no, but it always starts in seed form. But the thing that strikes me in this passage is that, is that these scoffers, they emerge because of the delay. Because of the delay. And I think there are at least four stages of what, how this scoffing begins. Number one is indifference. It's when we begin to feel indifferent about the promises. We begin to feel indifferent about the purpose, number one. Number two, that indifference turns into cynicism, where we kind of go, eh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what I think about that, just, just ever so slightly. Then it turns into disdain, because I want nothing to do with that. And then it turns into open criticism or open contempt. And so it's indifference, it's like, eh. cynicism is like, oh, I'm not so sure I think about that. Disdain, ah, don't want anything to do with that. And then there's open contempt related to the promises. I don't say this with, uh, with any glee in my heart at all, but I, I have personally have talked with believers over the years who, and, and I'm not even just relating to kind of like our promise here in Kansas City, but who have believed for that historic outbreak of the Holy Spirit. And because of the delay, and the cost and all the different dynamics that come with that have literally just said, you know what? I love the Lord. I love his word. I just want nothing to do with that. that I, just really, I just really don't want to mess with that. They're not being openly critical. They're not walking in open contempt. But these are examples of what happens in the heart, in the midst of the delay, when the promise is the primary thing rather than the beauty of him. The second thing that Peter says, he says that they walk according to their own lust. And I think there's four ways in which that happens. Number one, no longer willing to pay the cost. And, and that's what happens in, in Psalm 73 is the writer is actually mostly grappling with, hey, man, because I really laid it all on the line. Is it actually worth it to do so? Of course, and he finds out at the end of the psalm, he goes, the Lord reminds him, he goes, oh, my gosh, it's so worth it. It really, really is worth it for the sake of a generation. So questioning with the, the worth of the cost, secondly, begin developing ideas of why the fullness is actually no, it's, it's, it's not real, it's out of reach, it's, it's unrealistic, just beginning developing ideas that support that thought. Uh, thirdly, is uh, beginning to talk others out of the vision of the promise. And then thirdly, is openly mocking and criticizing the promise. But the thing that I wanted to catch is that the scoffers, they emerged because of the delay. That's the thing I wanted to highlight, number one. And number two, all of us, I'm putting all of us under that, myself included, we are vulnerable to that unless we engage with the primary component, which is the beauty of God, God as being our reward. It's absolutely amazing if you turn to Genesis 16. In Genesis 16, Sarah speaks to Abraham and she acknowledges God's divine restraint in verse 2 or God's strategic delay. She says, see now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. In chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, the Lord promised Abraham that they would have, that he would have a son and that they would have descendants. That was the promise. And here in verse 16, Sarah goes, you know what? There seems like the Lord, the Lord has restrained me in this. There, there's a delay here. And then, and then she says, as a result of that, she says, please do something about it. In other words, take matters into your own hands. It is part of what Peter's talking about where we, where we begin to walk in our own lust. We, we begin to take matters into our own hands. Now, the thing that's so amazing about this passage, and you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not throwing Sarah and Abram under the bus because they they is us. Right? But the thing that's amazing about this passage is that Sarah's disillusionment 
actually comes in the context of Genesis 15, which is a glorious passage about God being our reward and the promises of God that he has in store for them. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. And it's literally the next chapter where we see this disillusionment settle in into Sarah, and, 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 by, and, by, and, by, and, and because of Sarah, therefore, Abraham was, got caught up in it, in it as well. Now, the thing that's amazing is, is, is this, is that Abraham, he, I believe that part of the challenge in the story is that he missed the primary message, not the only message, but the primary message of what the Lord was trying to tell him in Genesis 15. And here it is in, in Genesis 15, verse 1. Abraham, the Lord appears to Abraham in a vision. Abraham, I am your shield. In other words, I am your protector. I will fight for you. I will guard you. And he says, and your exceedingly great reward. Abraham, I will protect you. Abraham, I am your prize. In a lot of ways, he's saying, Abraham, I am yours. The beautiful God, I am yours, he says to Abraham. I mean, can you imagine this encounter? Look at verse 2. But Abraham said, Lord, what will you give me? And, and that's the place where we find ourselves in. I mean, even your pastor finds himself there. And I've got facts because I showed him this verse this morning and he confessed his sins to me, <laughs> saying that this is him. So there you have it. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, no, no, this is where we find, or this is where I find myself all too often. The Lord says, Stuart, I am yours. Great, so where's the dot com? He's like, it's like, whoa, 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 slow down. <laughs> he goes, I'm yours. I am your reward. I am your prize. And Abraham says, but what will you give me? He's like, wait, what? <laughs> But again, that's, that, that's, that's all of our story. And so when the Lord visits Abraham, he communicates to him two very, very powerful realities. He says, I'm your shield, I'm your protection. I'm your protection in temptation. I'm your protection in disillusionment. I will fight for you. And secondly, I am your prize. I'm your everything. And the thing that's amazing when when the Lord tells Abraham, I am your prize, I am yours, I believe that's what happened there is what Paul said in Romans chapter 4. He says that Abraham understood that he was called to inherit the world because when the God of heaven and earth says, I am yours, guess what else is yours? So Abraham gets invited into the primary thing. He gets invited into the one thing that King David talks about. Psalm 27, 4. Let's go ahead and turn there. Psalm 27. Psalm 27, verse 4. David speaks from the understanding that the beauty of God is his reward. While believing for the fullness of the promise, Psalm 27, 13. Psalm 27, 4, David says, look, I will interact with my primary reward. I want to gaze on your beauty. I don't want to just gaze at it. I don't want to just look at it. I don't want to just experience it. He says, I want to inquire of it. In other words, I want to experience it, and I want to investigate it. I want to understand it. I want to grapple with it. I want to understand more of who you are insofar as your power, your personality, and your purpose. I want to understand it. I want to see it, I want to experience it through the word, and I, want to, and I want to ask you all kinds of questions about who you are and what you're up to and what you're doing. And I believe that that is part of what the Lord was, uh, was speaking to us about when he spoke audibly, Psalm 27, 4. He's saying, I have KC, 400 church, because I'm inviting you to engage with my beauty, to gaze on it, to experience it, and I'm gonna give you a sanctuary for you to keep where you can come and ask me all kinds of questions about my power, personality, and purpose. So the minister of intercession is, I believe, is primarily fueled by and sustained by the revelation of God's beauty. Psalm 145, it says, great is the Lord 
and greatly to be praised. In other words, because God is great, he is deserving of a corresponding praise. Great God, great praise. And then the psalmist continues, he says, and his greatness is unsearchable. To which we can say, therefore, his praise is unending. Night and day prayer is not just about the keeping of a schedule. It is a response to a God who is inexhaustible in his beauty and in his majesty. Without beauty, this issue of night and day prayer and worship doesn't really, really make sense. It is fueled and it's sustained by the revelation of the knowledge of him. And so when the Lord spoke audibly, Psalm 27, 4, he's saying, I, KC, 400 church. So with that comes a realm of understanding. Psalm 119, verse 18, I'm going to open up my word to you and show you great and glorious things. Jeremiah 33, 3, call out to me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things you do not know. The Lord has a prescribed way to protect our hearts from injury in the midst of the delay. Warfare, disappointments, the mundaneness of life, it's beauty, the beauty of him. Psalm 27 has very powerful protective components. Verse one, courage. The beauty of God gives us courage in the midst of warfare. Verse three, it gives us courage in the face of confidence, in the face of persecution. Verse five, it protects us in the midst of trouble. Verse six, it tenderizes our hearts with the song. Verse seven and eight, that hunger begets hunger. Satisfaction is more hunger, a sign of life. And as we engage in the beauty of the Lord, it creates a desire for more. Verse 10, companionship. Verse 11, instruction. Verse 12, the assurance of vindication. Verses 13 and 14, it gives emotional strength, resolve, and resilience. The beauty of God. Let's have the worship team come up. One of the main things that, of the beauty of God, that sustains our heart in nine-day prayer is the revelation of the bridegroom. The God who delights in us. Isaac mentioned earlier, Isaiah chapter 62, verse 6, this divine setting. I've heard Mike mention this several times over the years, that in the context of this divine setting is the revelation of the bridegroom. That he rejoices over us like a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. And so we want to feast often on that subject. And the Lord has so graciously given us so much content on this matter. You know, for some of you, you know, being in the prayer room for an hour or two seems overwhelming. Um, but, but start with, you know, taking some of this content and begin reading about the subject of the beauty of God. Take some time to read up on it and then take some time and talk to the Lord about it. Then take some time to pray for your family and then take some time to ask the Lord to touch Kansas City and touch the president. You know, it's something like that, you know. And, uh, and I tell you what, you just, you just make a list of some of those four things. I tell you what, time really would just go by. The thing that I just absolutely love, and I want to make this point, I made it earlier. This invitation that was given in 1983 wasn't just given to 500 staff. It was given to a community, and there are various levels of how we can engage. For almost 40 years, a 1,000 people have given themselves to do it uh, uh, once a week. And out of that 1,000, 200 gave themselves to do it three, two to three times a week. And I believe that the Lord is just really just wants to strengthen some of you if you give yourself to it. And some of you going, you know what? I, I think I want to do this. I'm going to give myself to this for once a week for a year. I'm just going to give myself to this thing and do Psalm 27.4. And begin to ask the Lord to, to unlock the beauty of God to me. Again, part of the glory of Forerunner Church is that it's anchored in the context of a night and day sanctuary. I just think that is so remarkable. And I'm so grateful to the Lord and that, and that grace gift to us as a family and that grace gift to us as a city. Amen? All right, let's stand.
This is a, uh, a message of the grace of God. The Lord said, this is what I'm inviting you into. And, I wanna, and I'm giving grace. There is grace available to lay hold of. So I'm just gonna pray for us. And then, uh, and then we're just gonna respond to the Lord by coming forward and, uh, and given, uh, putting our, our sacred trust on, on either side of the stage. Father, here we are. Lord, we are so grateful for you. And Father, as a people, Lord, we say that you are beautiful. You are great, Father. Your greatness is unsearchable. Father, your glorious majesty, splendor. Lord, would you equip our hearts? Ephesians 1, 17, Lord, would you release light and understanding, Father, equipping our hearts, Father, to peer into the manifold, the many layered components of your beauty. Father, would you increase, Father, in our midst, Father, your son's request to have a people that who are with him to behold his glory. Father, I ask you for new dimensions of your glory, Father, to be released on our hearts, Father. Release it on the singers. Release it on the musicians, Father. Release it on the intercessors. Release it on us as a community. Father, even in the night seasons, night unto night reveals knowledge. Father, I ask you, the night watch, Lord, that you would release the revelation of your beauty on them. And Father, I ask you, God, for, uh, for the rest, Father, those who are in the daytime. Father, I ask you, even in the night seasons, Lord, for these sudden moments, Father, of the brooding sense of your presence on our hearts, on our minds, speaking to us about beauty and who you are. Father, I say grace, grace to your intercessors. Grace, grace to the prophetic singers and musicians. Grace, grace, Father, to the gatekeepers. Grace, grace, Father. Grace, grace, in Jesus' name.